Take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians and uh, chapter number 2, Philippians chapter number 2. If you find your place there in Philippians chapter number 2, we will begin the study of the text in chapter number 2, but what we'll do is we'll um, read a little bit, little bit of the context uh, and go back to chapter 1 and deal with uh, the last few verses of chapter number 1. You know, the, uh, the chapter and verse division are there to help us to find our place in the Bible quickly. Uh, they're not uh, necessarily there to break a thought. And a lot of times when you go from a chapter to another, really the thought continues uh, and uh, they're much related. And uh, what I like to do there in verse, I would like to read verse 28 of chapter 1 and go on into chapter 2 and to read down to verse 4 of uh, chapter number 2. So Philippians chapter number 1 uh, let's uh, begin reading in uh, verse number 28. The Word of God says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now we'll stop here, and then next week we'll continue in dealing with chapter number 2. But I want us to consider verse number 2 again, where the Bible says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, such statements have already been spoken about, as we see in verse number 27, just a little bit earlier, where the Apostle Paul says this, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye know to stand fast with one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And here again in chapter 3, he says, look, to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Uh, this morning I want to preach on this subject, unity in Christ. Unity in Christ. Now, I hope that uh, the we will uh, gain an understanding this morning because there's much misunderstanding today about uh, unity. You know, we, we live, it is clear, we live in a world of conflict. There is much conflict in the world. Uh, and uh, that is what really is going on as Paul is dealing with things in his personal life, as he's dealing with prison. And perhaps some of those uh, uh, believers there at Philippi are also dealing with uh, conflict and opposition from the world. But what he is instructing them is to have unity in Christ. Now, before we go and study these few verses, I, I want us to consider a few things. That the emphasis is never unity. The emphasis is never unity. You say, well, what is the emphasis then? The emphasis is Christ. That's what the emphasis is. You know, there is much today people say, well, we got to be together. We got to be unified. We got to be in unity. We have to be in one accord. That is not really the emphasis. The emphasis is Christ. In other words, uh, the emphasis is always on Christ and His Word because that is what unifies us. Unity itself does not unify, Christ unifies. Uh, in other words, uh, think about it this way. Uh, today, uh, you know, everybody thinks differently. Uh, in other words, everybody is different, and uh, people like to uh, prefer certain things over the others. Sometimes people reason in different ways, uh, and uh, we all think differently, if you would. Uh, and sometimes people, we think in ourselves, sometimes we think, well, if everybody thought the way I did, things would be better. 
Well, not necessarily. I think that we need to draw our minds that if we all thought like Christ, then things would be better. And when we consider the subject of unity, because really throughout the book of Philippians, again, he's not dealing with any major doctrinal errors. He's not saying, look, you are adding works to salvation or you're propping knowledge above God, as he did in the, in the book of Colossae. He's not saying any of those things. He's just emphasizing some uh, practical things and how to behave as Christians, as believers, as a church, towards one another and together. And it is clear in this book that the emphasis is placed on Christ. The emphasis is placed on the gospel and that is where unity is found in other words the goal is never unity the goal is to always meet where Christ is that's the goal and by the way that not doesn't just apply for believers it applies to every area of of life whether it be marriage what is it that gives a husband and a wife unity it's Christ not unity itself because you can try to get along, but every once in a while, if one person gets the own, their own way of thinking and the other one goes the other direction, there's no unity there. You can try to get together as much as possible, but if Christ is not the center, then there will never be true unity. So when we think about unity in Christ, I don't want us to misunderstand. I'm not here and saying, let's have a group hug and sing kubaya. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's all meet where Christ is. And then we'll have unity. So, as we consider the subject here of chapter 1, going into chapter 2, Philippians chapter 1 really naturally leads into chapter 2. The first three verses of Philippians chapter 2 give the answers for the last three verses of Philippians chapter 1. He spoke, he spoke of, in chapter 1, at the end of the conflict that, that every Christian experiences. It is possible to have peace in the midst of conflict, and peace will be found when God's people think the same way. Paul concluded chapter 1 challenging the believers not to be fearful of their adversaries. And Paul begins chapter 2 by encouraging the believers to walk in unity and to become more like their Savior. So as we study these few verses, I want us to consider, first of all, the availability of unity. The availability of unity. The Bible says, notice in verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. So, well, what is he talking about? Well, consider here that the expression if is very important. Uh, Think about it this way here. This idea of if there be any consolation in Christ, uh, it communicates this. In view of the fact, or uh, since, since we have consolation in Christ. Since we have comfort of love, since we have fellowship of the Spirit, since we have bowels of mercies and, and, and mercies, or if you would, in the view of the fact that we have consolation in Christ, in view of the fact that we have comfort of love, in view of the fact that we have fellowship in the Spirit, then he says, do these things. So he begins here by talking about the availability of unity. The four things about about to be mentioned are not hypothetical in their nature. They are facts. If those things are true in our lives, therefore it enables us to live in unity. And we'll see that in chapter 2. But I want us to study those four areas that he says, since those things are true in your life, since those things are evident, therefore you ought to fulfill my joy. Now look at those four areas. First of all, he says, if there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ. You say, well, what does the word consolation mean? It is closely related, if you look at the root, uh, to the word comforter. That is found in John chapter 14, verse 16, when Jesus Christ introduces His disciples to the Holy Spirit of God, and He calls them the Comforter. The Comforter is abiding, notice, in the believer. He abides in us at the moment of salvation. And He says, look, if there be therefore any consolation, notice, in Christ. If we, as believers, find comfort in Christ, consolation, or help, uh, understanding in Christ, notice if that's the case, in view of that, then that will bring like-mindedness among the people of God. You see, 
It's impossible for someone to be unified with somebody else that's a believer if that person is not saved. There will never be unity there. Why? Because there is no consolation in Christ. You see, there is, there's, there's, there's not, no presence of the Holy Spirit of God. There's no encouragement and comfort that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. But as believers, if there is consolation in Christ, then there will be like-mindedness. He goes on to say, notice, if, there, note, if any comfort of love. Now, there is great comfort when Christ's love is manifested towards other believers. In other words, the consolation in Christ is manifested in us by comforting others in love. Put it this way, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So you see here, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, you see, what will be displayed by the fact that we have the Holy Spirit within us is the fact that our love for one another will be demonstrated. Uh, and he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4 that as we are comforted in tribulation, we are able then to comfort others. Why? Because love is present there. Love is the demonstration of our, this is the agape love, the demonstration of our love and our affection for others. In other words, because we go through certain things in our lives, we are able to comfort those going through the same types of things in their lives, and that ought to be present in our lives. If any consolation in Christ, in view of the fact that we have consolation in Christ, in view of the fact that there is comfort of love, he goes on to say the third one, if any fellowship of the Spirit... Now, the word fellowship means this, communion, or joint participation. So we see, number one, that there's consolation in Christ, there's comfort in love, but there's also communion with the Holy Spirit. Before he deals and says, look, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, what has to be settled is consolation in Christ. Is that there? Comfort of love, is that there? Fellowship in the Spirit, is that there? You see, today the emphasis is today, well, uh, let's get together and let's be unified about something. No, the first action of the believer is to turn around and say, am I examining my own life? Am I in communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God? If I am, then there will be unity. You see, uh, people today, they strive for unity. Well, we've got to get together. We've got to get along. No, you have to get along with the Holy Spirit of God, and then you can get along with other believers. You see, that is the, uh, the, the, uh, the platform, if you would, that leads uh, to unity, if any, notice, fellowship in the Spirit. Our communion with, and again, through the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, the Bible says, And then had all the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. Now, the Bible says, again, that as you read throughout the book of Acts, that the, the church in the book of Acts were always, it says, in one accord. That they kind of were together. They, they were striving for the same thing. They were doing the same thing. But all throughout the book of Acts, you'll see things like, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, these things are inseparable. When we in our lives have yielded ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God and allow Him to take control of our lives, that will bring about unity, like-mindedness among other believers. So, in view of the fact that there's consolation in Christ, in view of the fact that there's comfort of love, in view of the fact that there's any fellowship of the Spirit... And then he says, if any bowels of mercy. So there's consolation in Christ, there's comfort and love, there's communion with the Spirit. But number four, there's compassion and mercy. The word bowels here speaks of the seat of tender affections uh, like kindness, benevolence, and compassion. While consolation in Christ enables us to comfort and love... We understand that communion with the Spirit enables compassion for others. In other words, you look at those things, consolation in Christ 
produces, brings about comfort of love. And the fellowship of the Spirit brings about bowels and mercies. Communion brings about compassion. Jude 1, makes it clear. He says, and some have compassion. Well, what did it accomplish? Making a difference. But how is compassion possible? It is only possible when there's communion in the Spirit. So think about it this way here. Before he deals with unity in Christ and how they ought to be like-minded, he says this. In view of the fact that there is consolation in Christ, in view of the fact that there is comfort of love, in view of the fact that there is fellowship of the Spirit, in view of the fact that there is bowels and mercies, here's the area, areas of unity. Okay? So we see, first of all, the availability of unity, but number two, the areas of unity. The Bible says here, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Unity is never kept by accident. It is something we must diligently work towards. The Apostle Paul would rejoice to know that the believers at Philippi were all like-minded. We note the three areas in which we are to be like-minded. We speak of being like-minded. We are not saying of ourselves, well, uh, well, you know, if just everybody kind of thought like me, it would be a better place. That's just what I want to do. And if everybody just kind of got my mind on this, then everything would just be better. No. <laughs> but if we all thought like Christ, I think we would all agree that things would be better. You know, earlier Paul told the believers at Philippi, if you think about it, if you go back and notice to um, verse number 12 of chapter 1, look at what Paul says. He, he's in prison. He is encouraging the Hebrew Christians that are not in prison. He's just encouraging them. He's praying for them. But notice here what he wants them to understand in verse 12. He says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Do you see what he says? He says, I would that you should understand, brethren. What does that mean? Paul knew why the Lord allowed imprisonment to happen. He knew why. And therefore, he wanted the believers at Philippi to understand the same thing as to why things were happening. You see, they needed to be on the same page when it came to what God ordained for, the situ for Paul's situation. Paul knew what God was doing. He wanted the believers to be on the same page. He wanted the believers to be like-minded. He's not saying, I want you to think like me. He said, I want you to come and see that this has been the doing of God and the pur for the purpose of God. So let's think together like Christ. You see, he's already established that fact uh, quite well, uh, that they needed to be like-minded concerning the Lord's purpose for Paul's imprisonment. You know, there's a tremendous unity when we understand what the Lord is doing in our lives. There's no unity when we say, well, I think this is what's going to happen in my life, or I think this is what's happening, but there is unity when we understand what God is doing. To be like-minded is to see things in the same light. If we have what is listed in verse 1, then we must fulfill the potential of such a life that, pos that, that, that uh, possess, uh, possess these things. Notice, he talks about the three things. Notice, that ye be like-minded. Having noticed the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now notice here the expression, having, this is how we're going to be like-minded. Having the same love. You see, unity in the demonstration of our affection. The same love. Notice the emphasis is on, and we know what love is here, and the demonstration of our affection for one another, but he's talking about the same love. Not a different love, the same love. So it's really, think about it, it's the same thing. It's the same demonstration of our love. Now we know according to the Bible that the way we demonstrate our love ought to be according to understanding. In other words, it's not just a, 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 supposed to be a, 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 fuzz, a fuzzy feeling. We have to understand it. I hope we, we understand the truth that love is a choice. 
It's not a feeling. Now, when you choose to love, feelings come with it. But love is a choice. It's a decision. God does not, to, does not have to love us. But He chooses to. And so in the same way, you know, we choose, and I guess when our children come, you know, it is a choice to love our children. And even though sometimes they do the wrong things, we still choose to love them. It's a choice. Now, there's feelings that come with it, but again, love is more than a feeling. And so when we think about our love, it ought to be according to understanding. Say, well, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, I just don't feel like loving this brother or this sister. Well, it's not about a feeling. Choose to. I just don't get along. Then make a choice to get over yourself and to love. You see, the same love. Well, what's the focus of, 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 of that same love? It's Christ. Why? Because he's about to say that the like-minded is found in Christ. In verse 5, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, this same love that we're talking about is what type of love? It's the type of love that Jesus Christ demonstrated. Well, how did he demonstrate his, his love? Well, the Bible tells us, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, that's the type of love that Christ demonstrated uh, for his creation. He died to redeem his creation. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was a choice. He chose to, uh, to die. He chose to give his life. He chose to shed his blood. Nobody took it from him. That's the type of love. That's the same love where we unite together. Well, how do we demonstrate our love? Like Christ demonstrated his love. That's the same love. That's where we meet. It is this. It is sacrificial love. Now, we'll see a little later. He says this, look not, in verse 4, look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. You see what he's saying? He's saying that you ought to uh, esteem others better than yourself. That means give the priority to somebody else. Illustration, very simple. If we're having fellowship Sunday night, and there's one piece of brownie left, at the dessert table. And someone comes to the table and wants to grab it, but they see somebody else, they're both eyeing the same brownie. The same love says, you know what, I'll esteem you better. Here's the brownie. <laughs> okay, now that's a simple illustration, but it's just to illustrate the fact that it's just preferring esteeming others better than yourself. You know what, I'll give you the priority. I'll prefer you over what I want. And by the way, probably eating the brownie is not good for me anyways. So here's a brownie. You can die. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, you see, the same love. Sacrificial love. You see, unity is found in our demonstration of the love of Christ. So, we see having the same love. But number two, he talks about, notice, being of one accord. Now, the first one he says, having the same love, but then he talks about being, uh, notice, of one accord. This speaks of unity in the Spirit. Uh, the, be part of the Spirit of the church. Being in heart agreement. In other words, being in one accord, that means is, you know, kind of getting involved and saying, look, uh, we're doing this as a church. Let's do this as a church. Let's move, move forward for the Lord. It's not someone that stands on the sideline and says, well, you know, uh, you know, y'all have a good time. You know, I just, I just do the church thing just, you know, because I want it to make me, I'm not going to be involved. Don't make me do anything now uh, because that's not being in one accord. That's not the spirit of the church where everybody is involved in doing something. And so he says, look, uh, be of same mind, being of one accord. Now we say, well, being one spirit, be going to the same direction. He talks about in chapter 1 and verse uh, 27, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's being of one accord. So again, the same love is talking about the love of Christ. Being of one accord is talking about the purpose of Christ. Where is Christ headed today? When we think about the work of God, where is he headed? What is he doing? Well, he's at work. He's changing people's lives. 
And He gives us specifically commands to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to give out His word, uh, to witness, to be what we need to be. So being in one accord, that means we meet Christ at what He's, where he's, at what he's doing. What is He doing? He's interested in changing people's lives. That's what He's interested in. And therefore, being of one accord, we all press towards the same uh, purpose, the spirit of the church. Why? Because we want to be where Christ is. We want to be involved where Christ is involved. And by the way, the work of the church is simply this, is to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ. We don't have church so that we can come up with our own version of church and what a church is supposed to be and what a church is supposed to do. We establish a church because we want to continue what Jesus Christ started and continue that till He comes. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's His church. It's His work. And so if we're going to be of one accord, we're going to have to meet Christ at His church in doing His work. So, having the same love, being of one accord, and then He says, of one mind. So, Unity, this speaks of the unity in the way we think and the things we entertain in our minds. Really this idea here of being of one mind is this, think the same thought. So how do we think the same thought? Well again, verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, one mind now, let's remind ourselves, as we've studied the Word of God, we find that the Bible states very clearly in the book of Ephesians that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's in charge. Well, if you think about the head, it's what controls everything. Everything submits to the head. Why? Because the head is in charge. So, being of one mind uh, is where we are thinking like Christ. We say, well, how can we think like Christ? Well, it's not really that difficult. It's right here. How can I think like Christ? Well, right here, these pages tell us how God thinks and tells us how we ought to think. You mean you're trying to brainwash me today? Yeah. Yes. Because I want you to think like Christ. So yes, I want to brainwash you to think like Christ. I think we would all admit that if we are all brainwashed to think like Christ, I think that would be a good thing. You know, think about it. When the Sermon on the Mount, it's contrary to the world. But that's the way Christ thinks. We've been studying that on Wednesday evenings, on being discipled by Christ. And really, the, 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 the attitude and the thinking is completely in reverse in the world. We have to come and we have to study those things. We have to allow Christ to Why? So that we can think the same thought. Which goes contrary to the world. So, we see here, very important, he says, look, since there's consolation in Christ, in the view of the fact that we have the comfort of love, in the view of the fact that there is fellowship in the Spirit, in the view of the fact that there is bows and mercies, look, that's the availability of unity. It, it, we are able to have unity. Why? Because of the Spirit of God and because of our salvation. And therefore, because of that, we can be like-minded. We can be of the same love. We can be of one accord. And we can be of one mind. It is possible. And where do we meet? At Jesus Christ. So we see the third thing is this. Not only the availability of unity, the areas of unity, but number three, the authenticity of unity. How do we know that unity is present? Well, he says it right there. Verse three. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How do we know that we're like-minded? It'll be displayed. It'll be displayed. It will be evidenced. It will be authenticated. Notice number one, I want us to, as we think about the authenticity of unity, we see first of all the collapse of unity. He says this, let nothing be done through strife, or vain glory. Now, I like what one commentator put it. I, I wrote it down in my notes. I thought it was very good. He says, Strife pulls the other person down 
Vainglory puts oneself up. You see, strife is trying to pull people down around us, and vainglory is propping ourselves up. And really, the only reason why there's strife and conflict is because we do that for the purpose of propping ourselves up. The only reason why we criticize somebody because we don't like them is because we like to have people think better of ourselves than we ought to think. So the collapse of unity happens by strife. Notice in vain glory, both of these sentiments produce discord in the local church. I just, you see examples all throughout the Bible, but I think one of the greatest examples is that the children of Israel when they left Egypt. It was evident that there was a spirit of strife and vain glory. Think about the uh, rebellion of Korah and Dathan and Abiram who challenged the right of Moses to, uh, and Aaron to be the leaders of God's people. Well, what did they try to do? They tried to pull Moses down and they propped themselves up. That's what they wanted to do. You see, so when there's that going on in a church, when there's strife, when there's conflict trying to tear people down and pull people down, and when there's people trying to prop themselves up, there is no unity there. But how do we see unity? So we see the collapse of unity, but number two, we see the constant of unity. He says this, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You see, humility is the opposite of conceit and self-ambition. It's the opposite, really, of strife and vainglory. The word esteem is very important. Such an attitude which does not rest on one's feelings or sentiments. Uh, you see, this idea of esteeming is, uh, the, you know, esteem them better. The word better literally, literally means having above to excel or to surpass. You see, this humility will result in, in us showing preferential treatment towards another. Preferring one another over ourselves. Well, we have unity. Do you prefer your brother or your sister in Christ? Above yourself? Do you give them priority over yourself? Or do you want the last brownie? <laughs> that was referring to the illustration a little earlier, in case you missed it. So the constant of unity, notice lowliness of mind, humility, esteeming others better than ourselves. But then we see not only the constant of unity, but we see the caring of unity. He says this, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now the word look means this, Look not every man on his own thing, but also on the things of others. It means this, To fix the attention upon, which, uh, upon with desire for, an, uh, for and an interest in. In other words, to fix our attention upon. Don't just look at your own interests for yourself, but also look for the interest of others. This is not saying get in other people's business. No, it's saying look for people's interests. Don't have just your own interests at heart because we know you have that at heart. Have other people's interests at heart as well. You see, that is the authenticity of unity. That's how we know that there's unity in the church. How do we know that people think the same way? How do we know that people have the, uh, have the same love? How do we know that people are of one accord? How do we know that people uh, are of one mind? Because of the constant of unity, which is seen in humility, because of the humility of God's people, but also because of the care of God's people that is exemplified in people's lives. Proverbs 3.27 says this, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. So let me put this way, because some, sometimes people, people go crazy with those things. Say, wow, you're supposed to, look, if there's a need and someone has a need, someone is, say, hey, look, I, I need money, I need food, or whatever the case may be, you should not be going in debt to help that person. Are we clear with that? You should not do something unbiblical to help a person. If it is in your power to do it, then perhaps it's God's will. If you violate the scriptures, it's never God's will. Okay, 
But if it is fulfillment of the scripture, then yes, that's, that's a good thing. And so again, if it is in the power of thine hand to do it, then you ought to prefer one another. It's not saying, look, uh, give to everybody else, but you, you, know, you go in debt and you live a poor life. No, uh, you look out for your own interests, but make sure at the same time that you look for the interests of others. In other words, life is not just about us. We know the Bible says, look, that if a man doesn't provide for his own house, he's worse than an infidel. That's clear in the scriptures. We take care of that. But at the same time, God gives us the ability to take care of other people's needs as well. If it is within our ability, we should do it. As the Holy Spirit of God guides us. You know, we live today in a self-centered society. We do. You know, everybody's got their own gadgets and everybody is imploding in their own lives and nobody is supposed to, uh, to do anything. When someone talks to you, Get off the phone. When someone's talking to you, don't go. Uh, can, uh, do we realize what, what it looks like today? Right. It's all self-centered. You go to a restaurant. Uh, you know, we went to uh, a, a, a few weeks ago. Well, it's probably a few months ago now. Uh, but I remember we, were, uh, we went to, to Applebee's, and there was a family sitting over here, and father, mother, son, and daughter were all on their phones. And the whole time they were there, they didn't talk to one another. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm thinking... Right. That's a self-centered. Everybody's doing their own thing. Think that is not supposed to be for the people of God. Right. You know, those things may give us the ability to do many things, but what they've done is they've blinded us to the needs of people around us and to the things going on around us. You see, the mind of Christ is not a selfish mind centered upon itself and its own needs, rights, and wants. The mind is the, for one purpose, to do what God wants it to be done in this world. It is constantly looking at the needs of others. You say, well, look, why does Paul uh, say those things? You know, Paul seems to be a man that was tremendously used of God. And notice he seemed to always look for the needs of others. He was in prison, but yet he prayed for other people. He had needs. Yes, he did. But he prayed for their needs. You see, that is the Apostle Paul. How can such a life be lived? Well, if we are dead to self, then things shouldn't be too difficult if we're dead. One commentator put it this way. I liked what he said. He says, Paul had no ambition, so he had nothing to be jealous about. Paul had no reputation, so he had nothing to fight about. Paul had no possessions, so he had nothing to worry about. Paul had no rights, so he could suffer no wrong. Paul, had already broken, uh, Paul was already broken, so no one could break him. Paul was dead, so no one could kill him. Paul was less than the least, so who could humble him? Paul suffered the loss of all things, so none could defraud him. Isn't that the truth? When we're self-centered, we look at all the things that happen in our lives and we are still self-centered. But if we are dead to self, then things change. The economy changes in our lives. You see, the way to peace in the midst of conflict, the way to have the joy of the Lord in the midst of conflict is to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and all that we have in Him. We need unity. No, what we need more than anything is Christ. That's what we need. And look, if we all meet at Christ, here's the byproduct. The unity will happen. Unity will happen. And I'll show you how it happened. Here's the evidence of it. People will esteem others better than themselves. And people will care for the needs of others. They're not going to care just for their own interests, but they're going to care for the interests of other people. So, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Unity in Christ. It's not about unity. It's about Christ. May the Lord help us.